This was a small excerpt from a song that I wrote for my first album. And uh, there's a little story behind it. It was the first time I experienced recording in a very unusual setting and environment. So a couple of summers ago, me and my very good friend Christoph Austers, who's also becoming a great sound engineer, we went to my countryside home to record a couple of ideas. And one day the weather was particularly good, so we decided to record outside. And it was the time for the guitar, and what Christoph came up with was to put the guitar amplifier in front of a nearby lake. So what happens is the sound from the amplifier goes in the lake, well, not into the water, but it goes over the lake and then bounces off the surrounding forest and then comes back. So we put two microphones on the shore to catch that. And this is how it sounds. <laughs> So when mixing a song, usually what you do if you need a reverb, you use a digital one. But instead we use the one that Lake provided us. And of course it's not perfect, you know, it, it, you, can, you can hear many different things in it. There's locusts and grasshoppers and wind and birds and everything. But I remember that experience recording that and listening to that through the earphones and then, you know, when, when working on the song, listening to the recording back again. And I just fell in love with that moment because it sort of seems like the whole meadow is somehow interacting with the music and working with it together. And I got very hooked on that feeling. So looking for different uh, ways how to record music and uh, searching for these different musical elements became like a hobby for me. See, I was born in a family of musicians and my dad is a court conductor and my mom teaches kids how to sing. And although I quickly fell in love with some aspects of music, there were never ones a person could seemingly build a career on. Um, I didn't enjoy children music school that much. However, I started my first rock band around the age of 12. But it was very difficult for me to understand when and how basic solfeggio overlaps with the sound of, let's say, Nirvana. You know. I didn't enjoy the concerts. My parents were taking me too, too much. The music seemed way too complex and it wasn't really speaking to me. However, I always loved hearing my dad playing piano at home and preparing for rehearsals and uh, concerts. This is actually a tiny piece by Giorgi Ligeti for a choral piece, Lux Eterna. But the way it sounds out of context is very childlike and it almost seems random. And when I was a kid, I loved, you know, just sitting down at the piano and smashing the keys, then playing a couple of notes, listening to them, what's going on there, then smashing the keys again. So hearing my dad, a professional musician, playing these things made it more relatable in a sense. It was a lot later in life when I started to hear and maybe somewhat understand how these things turn into the beautiful pieces of art they actually are. Let's listen to that in the full context and try to hear that little piano thing in there. catch that? I mean that little piano piece that sounds so simple now in the full context has become something amazingly an immense beauty. Let's listen to that again and I'll sing it along where it goes. So I was growing up and, you know, I felt very strongly about music, but becoming a rock star did not seem like the safest career path. So I decided to study something else and I went to study economics in Stockholm School of Economics in Riga. However, at the end of my studies, it became really clear to me that there's nothing I would rather do for the rest of my life other than music. And this was around the time when me and Christos went to the countryside home and I got really into field recording. So one day my mom asked me to come to her workplace to record her students playing drums. 
So I went there, I uh, set up the microphones, put the chairs into place, and started testing drums on the microphones. And le later, when listening back to the recording, this moment caught my attention. Let's listen to that one again. So it goes. I mean, the way the floor creaks and the chair and the drum booms seemed to have built a rhythm of its own. So my only task was to find the right tempo, cut it out, loop it, and then start adding layers and layers and sounds on top of it. So this is what came out. So yeah, this has sort of become like a little addiction for me to, to look for these elements. And although they rarely play an important role in my music, they somehow provide that bonding bridge between the real world and then the song. And it's also that immense pleasure which you get when you find like a missing puzzle piece that's been under your bed for like past 10 years and you need that thing to complete the work. Uh, especially when you don't have to adjust it and it just fits perfectly. <laughs> These are huge metal wind chimes in a temple somewhere in Vietnam, and I was there a couple of years ago and recorded this with my phone. And then some time passed and I was working on a song and I needed these eerie, atmospheric, bell-like sounds, and I tried out many different kinds of synths and nothing was really working, so I went to my music library and found this thing, and I, yeah, just put it on there and it just works. This is how it sounds. <laughs> So yeah, I guess what I'm trying to say is uh, fairly simple, and maybe it even sounds like a cliche, but I do believe we live in a world that's full of wonders, and it's right here for us to take and explore, and all you have to do sometimes is just pay attention and, well, listen. And uh, now I would like to introduce you with my band and my very good friends, Christian Bremsch on drums. And Christian Spiegel's on bass. <laughs> and we would like to play a song for you that's called Call, and it's partially based on two wooden logs hidden against each other, recording that, resampling that, and then uh, using that as a rhythmic basis for the first part of the song. Thank you.
Oh,